podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twyatt, This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 366, recorded November 1st, 2019. An electronic bridge too far. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Taylor Store. Taylor Store makes high quality dress shirts that are fully customizable by you. With their exclusive trial price, each new customer gets their dress shirt starting from $39. From the basic essentials to the most high-end details, Taylor Store has got you covered. Go to taylorstore.com slash enterprise, offer code enterprise. And by Worldwide Technology. Worldwide Technology's Advanced Technology Center is like no other testing and research lab with over 150 different security services and applications, including OEMs like Cisco Umbrella, and it's virtual, so you can access it 24-7. To learn more and get insights into all that it has to offer, Go to www.com slash twit. And by Thinks Canary. Detect attackers on your network with honeypots that can be deployed in minutes. For 10% off and a 60-day money-back guarantee, go to canary.tools slash twit and enter the code twit in the How Do You Hear About Us box. Welcome to Twiet. Hey, look at that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Welcome to Twyatt. This week at Enterprise Tech, the show that's dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and that geek who just wants to know how this world is connected. I'm your host, Louis Moreska, your guys with this big, giant world of the enterprise, but I definitely can't guide you by myself. I need to bring in the professionals, the experts in their field, starting with our very own Mr. Curtis Franklin, senior editor at Dark Reading. Curtis, are you all geared up for Maker Faire coming up pretty soon here? Well, Lou, we're getting there. We're going to spend a lot of time this coming week uh, over at the Central Florida Fairgrounds doing all kinds of setup. We've got the um, the BattleBot Arena to install, and we have over 300 exhibitors who are going to be there. So I'm looking forward to it. In the meantime, I continue to get my words over at Dark Reading and uh, have a couple of really cool articles coming up. I'll tell the uh, listeners all about them at the end of the show. Fantastic. Now, you're heading to Microsoft Ignite in the coming weeks as well, too, right? I am. You know that next week, my cup runneth over. Ignite is the first part of the week. Maker Fair is the second part of the week. So, uh, you know, I will be reporting on Ignite at uh, Dark Reading and the edge of Dark Reading. Uh, looking forward to some interesting stuff. I've gotten some uh, some hints about what's going to be there, and I think there are going to be some mighty fascinating stories coming out of the Orange County Convention Center this, this coming week. Busy, busy. Well, speaking of busy, we have our very own Geek in Paradise, the Director of Advanced Network Computing Laboratory in Honolulu, Mr. Brian G. Chebert. What have you been cooking up down there in the great state of Hawaii? Well, we just had our Soast open house, and the numbers are in. 6,000 kids, and we again ran out of school buses. <laughs> so... <laughs> It was a great day for STEM education, I'll tell you that. Sounds fantastic. Well, thanks so much, everybody, for being here. But, folks, we have a jam-packed show for you today. Not only, like, for instance, have you ever rented a car and you've kind of used those new remote features that start the vehicle, lock the doors? Well, you may want to listen to our bites for today. Plus, is cybersecurity a moral imperative? Think about it. We'll get into that discussion as well. And we have a great guest, Jonathan Lieberman, uh, CEO and co-founder of Itopia, to talk about VDI and desktop as a service. But before we get into all that goodness, there's been some pretty interesting blips in this news week. Let's go ahead and jump into those. So messaging apps have always been a large market, and there's always been a diverse set of solutions in the market for that. Now, with Facebook continually under the gun, especially around privacy, it's only natural that their messaging app is as well, according to especially WhatsApp. Now, if you were wondering what the largest market for WhatsApp was, both in the consumer and the business space, is actually India. Now, with a whopping 400 million users, India wants to know more about what Facebook is doing to ensure privacy on their WhatsApp messaging platform. In fact, there is a formal and public ask by the technology minister of India, Ravi Shankar Prasad, 
Now, what are they asking about privacy? Well, it's actually an in unintended consequence to Facebook and WhatsApp suing the Israeli surveillance firm NSO Group of helping government spies break into the phones of roughly 1,400 users across four continent, continents, including diplomats, political dissidents, journalists, and government officials. Now, the attack, according to WhatsApp, exploited its video calling system in order to send malware to the mobile device of a number of users. Now, the malware would allow NSO clients, said to be governments and intelligent organizations, to secretly spy on a phone's owner, opening their digital lives up to scrutiny. Now, people familiar with WhatsApp investigations said that significant number of Indian civil society civil society figures were put under surveillance using the Israeli spyware. That would be something that could spark government officials to question the nature of the breach, don't you think? Well, back in May, WhatsApp stopped an attack where an advanced cyber actor exploited the video calling to install malware on the devices, so it's only proper that victims are questioning whether they are vulnerable due to it. Now, globally, WhatsApp is used by some 1.5 billion people monthly and has often touted a high level of security, including and, and encrypted messages that cannot be deciphered by WhatsApp or other third parties. Now, the breach was surprising, actually surprised people and organizations, and they're wondering if there can no longer be a trusted platform for them here. With these things continuing to come up from Facebook's platform, it might be time for people to start rethinking their use cases. Well, speaking of people rethinking use cases, the patent office is looking to AI to get some help. Now, last week on Twyatt, we had a discussion on problems around changes to the system for challenging patents. And so this week, it was interesting to see news that the Patent Office is enlisting the help of AI to examine and inspect patent applications before patents are granted. Last month, the Patent Office posted a job opening for a tech expert to guide the use of artificial intelligence and other AI-enabled capabilities across the agency reporting to its CIO, Jamie Colcom. The goal, they say, is to speed up the overall process, in part by automating aspects of the research performed by staff examiners and supervisors, reducing mundane administrative tasks, and eking out efficiencies in the process. In addition to the Patent Office initiative, the U.S. federal government's fiscal year budget for 2020 requested $973.5 million for unclassified non-defensive AI research and development. On top of that, last year DARPA announced a $2 billion initiative to develop AI technologies. Now, just to prove that AI research isn't all on the government services side, the Patent Office says they're grappling with a broader issue. Can an AI system be recognized as the inventor of a product? Might want to stay tuned for that one. Well, our friends at the FCC are in the news again, and this time it's FCC is saying they have plans for a Huawei ZTE ban and may require ripping out existing network gear. Federal Communications Commission Chairman Ajit Pai is moving ahead with a ban on equipment from Chinese vendors Huawei and ZTE in U.S.-funded telecom projects. The FCC will vote on Pi's proposal at its November 19th meeting, the commission said in an announcement and fact sheet that was released just the other day. Pi's proposal, quote, would bar communications companies from using any support they receive from the FCC's Universal Service Fund to purchase equipment or services from companies posing a national security threat like the Chinese companies Huawei Technologies Corporation and ZTE Corporation, according to the announcement. The order specifically designates Huawei and ZTE as, quote, companies that pose a national security risk, unquote, and would create, quote, a process for designating other suppliers that pose a national security threat, according to the FCC. I also should say that Huawei's network gear is used by numerous small and rural internet providers. So while the rip and replace order hasn't been issued yet, it is likely to appear in the not too distant future. To put this into perspective, those really cool single fiber cable boxes that have been just appearing all over America and in many cases made by Chinese vendors that would likely appear on this ban list. 
So the process to do the rip and replace, the cost to consumers would likely have to rise since the alternatives are in some cases two to five times more expensive, not to mention uh -huh, the impact on the new 5G mobile installations. Now, we know browsers are at the forefront of a ton of solutions in the enterprise, especially including new application platforms. Now, if the browser that hosts this content is vulnerable, so is your solution and property. Now, well, Google actually has some bad news for you this week. There is a new zero-day bug in the Chrome browser, and attackers are actively exploiting it in the wild to hijack your computers. Yikes. Now, without revealing technical details of the vulnerability, the Chrome security team only says that both issues are what they call use after free vulnerabilities, one affecting Chrome's audio component, while the other resides in the PDFium library. And to give you a bit more detail, the use after free vulnerability is a class of memory corruption issues that allows corruption or modification of data in memory, enabling an unprivileged user to escalate privileges on an infected system or software. Now, that means that both flaws could enable remote attacks to gain privileges on the Chrome browser just by convincing targeted users into visiting a malicious website, allowing them to escape the sandbox protections and actually run arbitrary malicious code on their system. That means if your users are using Chrome to browse the web or your app embeds Chrome, it might also be allowing attacks to take over your machine as well. Now, your weakest links are your users, right? Well, so get to it. You, The use after free issue is one of the most common vulnerabilities discovered and patched in the Chrome web browser in the past few months. Just over a month ago, Google actually released an urgent security update for Chrome to patch a total of four use after free vulnerabilities in different components of the web browser, the most severe of which actually allowed remote hackers to take control of an effective system. Now, the patch both security vulnerabilities, you actually have to, Google has already had started rolling out a Chrome version of 78.0.3904.87 for both Windows, Mac, and Linux operating systems. If you have a way to ask your users to update apps on their machine or you have an automated way, it might be time for you to force a Chrome update too. While security pros are afraid of insider attacks that come with the use of cloud apps. According to a new survey, security professionals think that cloud applications are more vulnerable to insider attacks, and they say that insider attacks are more difficult to detect since migrating to the cloud. In a survey of more than 300 security pros conducted by Cybersecurity Insider, sponsored by Securonix, 70% report insider attacks have become more frequent in the past year, and 21% have experienced more than five insider attacks in that same time frame. Now, more than half of those uh, answering the, the survey, 56%, say that monitoring, detecting, and responding to insider threats is at best somewhat effective. Now, many of these pros seem to think that cloud applications themselves are to blame. 39% identified cloud storage and file sharing apps as the most vulnerable to inside attacks, and 56% believe detecting insider attacks has grown significantly or somewhat harder since they migrated to the cloud. Now, despite the perceived risk, only 40% say that they monitor user behavior across their cloud environments, and nearly 70% say they feel moderately to extremely vulnerable to those same insider threats that they're not really monitoring. When asked about the individuals who pose the greatest risk for insider attacks, 59% pointed to privileged IT users or admins, followed by just over half who said that contractors and service providers or temp workers are the source of the greatest risk. So, yes, here's the other half of that story. Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister of the UK may let Huawei access the UK's 5G network. So while Ajit Pai's FCC is looking to rip out Huawei and ZTE equipment in the US, it seems the UK's Johnson administration is nudging the doors open for non-contentious portions of the UK's 5G network. Quote, the UK government apparently observed that some of Huawei's technology isn't available in the West. So Britain's next generation wireless infrastructure could be left behind if it doesn't do business with the Chinese company. A decision is expected in November, according to the Sunday Times. 
Obviously, the jury is still out on whether the Trump administration or the Johnson administration is correct on letting China's biggest communications companies outfit what could potentially be fairly sensitive communications infrastructure. Now, does you or your organization use QNAP NAS devices? If so, you might want to look into whether devices are vulnerable or not. The Cybersecurity Organization of National Cybersecurity Center of Finland spotted the malware last week for the Taiwanese-based hardware company, QNAP and its devices. Now, dubbed QSnatch, this strain of malware has infected over 7,000 German-owned devices alone, according to the German Computer Emergency Response Team. Now, how bad is this malware? Well, once it gains access to the device, QSnatch burrows into the firmware to gain reboot persistence. Now, this means it modifies OS time jobs and scripts. It also prevents future firmware updates by overwriting update source URLs. Plus, it prevents the native QNAP malware remover app from running, and it extracts and steals username and passwords for all the NAS users. Not good. Now, what's the end, end goal of the malware? Well, it's actually not clear, but it does seem that it is either developed to carry an, out a DDoS attack, either that or perform hidden cryptocurrency mining, or just a way to backdoor QNAP devices to steal files or host malware payloads for future operations. Now, one theory is that the QSnatch operators are currently in the phase where they're building their botnet and it will deploy other modules in the future. Now, in fact, in Finland, analysts confirm that QSnatch has the ability to connect to a remote command and control download and then run other modules. Now, how do you deal with the infection if your device has it? Well, for the time being, the only confirmed method of removing QSnatch has been performing a full factory reset of the device. What's worse is QNAP NAS owners are advised to disconnect their devices from the internet. And once they do that, they're supposed to change all their passwords for all accounts on the device, remove unknown user accounts from the device, make sure the device firmware is up to date and all the applications are updated, remove unknown or unused applications from the device, install QNAP malware remover application via the app center, and then set an access control list for the device. This is not good for QNAP. QNAP puts out some great devices. I hope this isn't a means to the end for them. Well, folks, that does it for the blips. Next up, we have the bites. But before we get to the bites, we have to thank a really great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that's Taylor Store. Now, it's hard to find custom quality shirts that fit us. I know this because it's super hard. Now, that's why I am really excited that Taylor Store is on Twyya. They offer high-quality made-to-order dress shirts for both men and women that are fully customizable and tailored to your measurements. Now, first of all, not only do they have endless sets of combinations, but their experience is actually a ton of fun as well. Now, you don't know your exact size. They have an amazing and fun Size Me app that actually revolutionizes the me measurement process using advanced technology algorithms. Use your mobile device to be pointed at yourself and bam, they got the right size. I'm not kidding. It's that easy. You no longer need a tape measure. I received my shirt and it was actually a perfect fit. Now, in the voice of Ace Ventura, like a glove, it only took a couple seconds to do, actually. It's, it, it took my measurements right away. It got the, actually got the focus on the fun part of the experience, which is actually choosing all the options that I had. Uh, as a 100% carbon neutral business, Taylor Store challenges the traditional fashion industry with the I, its new way to actually purchase clothes. Ready-made garments and off-the-rack sizes really has no place in the modern more world. People are individual and Taylor Store embraces the individualism. There are virtually endless options to choose from. They have a selection of finished designs that can be directly purchased or used as a starting point for customization. Now, their perfect fit guarantee takes away the risk of your ordering. If your dress shirt doesn't fit as you would like, they'll actually remake it for free. Just snap two pictures of wearing the shirt. They make the necessary adjustments and send you a new shirt promptly at no cost. In fact, there's no returns. The faulty shirt is yours to keep or to give to charity. Now, gone are the days when custom made to measure shirts were at an, a luxury item. Wherever you are, look and feel your very best in perfect fit clothes made only by Taylor Store. With their exclusive trial price, each new customer gets their dress shirt starting from only $39. That's 50% off the regular price. Go to taylorstore.com slash enterprise with offer code enterprise to get yours. You also get free shipping. Terms and conditions apply. That's taylorstore.com slash enterprise with offer code enterprise. Experience the unrivaled fit and comfort of Taylor Store's hand-picked fabrics 
for yourself. We thank Taylor Store for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Well, folks, it's time for the bites. Now, you probably have rented a car before and while on a business trip or something or even on a vacation. Now, have you ever used those mobile device apps with it? Well, Cheever has some interesting news for you about those apps. Cheever? I tell you, in a storyline that sounds straight out of a detective mystery or maybe a spy movie, Masamba Sinclair rented a Ford Expedition from Enterprise Rent-A-Car last May. He's excited to connect it to Ford Pass. The app allows drivers to use their phones to remotely start and stop the engine, lock and unlock the doors, and track the vehicle's precise location. Quote, I enjoyed it and logged into Ford Pass to be able to access vehicle features from my phone, such as locking, unlocking, starting the engine, and so forth. Sinclair, who is 34, told the author, I like the idea of it more than I found it useful. The UI does look good and work well, though. Now, Sinclair's option of mobile apps was decidedly less favorable. That's because five months after he returned the vehicle on May 31st, his app continues to have control over the vehicle. Despite multiple other people renting the SUV in the intervening months, Ford Pass still allows Sinclair to track the location of the vehicle, lock and unlock it, and start and stop its engine. Sinclair has brought the matter to Ford's attention, both through its website and multiple times on Twitter. So far, Ford has done nothing to kill his access. All it took was me downloading the application and entering the VIN number, then confirming connectivity through the infotainment sister system, Sinclair said last week in the article. There might be a way to disassociate my phone from the car itself, but that happen, hasn't happened yet. And it's crazy to put the onus on renters to have to do that. I have no problems at all and have even unlocked the doors and started the engine when I could see that the vehicle was in the Missoula Airport rental car parking lot. Enterprise spokesperson Lisa Martini wrote in an email, Several years ago, we implemented employee training on best practices for clearing data as part of our standard vehicle cleaning procedures. Additionally, we have information in our privacy policy and rental agreements to remind customers to remove their data when returning a car. You also work closely with the various automotive manufacturers to ensure we update and enhance our procedures as needed in response to new features and technologies that are added to vehicles. To that end, we understand the concerns this specific situation has raised and are actively working with Ford to implement protocols for customers who attempt to enable this feature on a rental car using their personal account. So, dang. Talk about unintended consequences. Great feature. Um, some of the Ford features, you know, it's in this day and age, I would hope that such things are easy to clear or easier. When we're doing some research, both in reading the article and myself, because I'm a Ford owner, getting to the system re factory reset, you know, the clear all command, so to speak. On the Ford Sync system, I have Sync 2 in my personal car. This is this guy's talking about Sync 3. It is ungodly difficult to do. You actually have to traverse like five menus. So something's going to have to change. Now, Lou, your development person, this shouldn't be hard. In fact, Sync is actually technically a Microsoft product still, I think. Um, this shouldn't be hard to do, right? Maybe some sort of, maybe a special USB key that is issued to the rental car companies that the cleaners can stick in and then clean the application. Is that really that hard to do? Is it a, are you, are we creating a big security hole? What do you think? <laughs> It's a good question. I think I don't think I think Ford Sync has been decoupled from any Microsoft services for a while. But I think okay. I think what you're saying is right. I think um, in this case, when you have multiple users, it, it it might not be a use case of the app. I mean, obviously, you in a family, you might have multiple users, uh, but having this kind of um, detach and release kind of scenario where you have a user log in and then detach from it for no longer to be able to use it. 
um, should be possible with these types of apps, especially if somebody like Hertz or something is going to kind of actually offer these apps and these types of devices uh, for their for their vehicles. Um, my guess is it wasn't designed for that, which means that Maybe this particular rental company thought, oh, well, we'll take advantage of this particular service because it's cool and none of, none of our older vehicles have it uh, and we'll let customers use it. But in this case, maybe they didn't contact Ford and say, hey, this is the use case we're going to be using it for because it doesn't seem like it's supported here. Uh, but in the same sense, luckily, this type of service, like I have it like on my device, on my vehicle as well. There's not really any danger in it, obviously, because one, there's some measures into it where, like, for instance, if the doors are not locked, the car can't go on or off, um, you know, things like that. There's some kind of physical measures within the within the vehicle that the whoever users logged in, they can't kind of control that. Um, they're more of just a um, uh, to help assist people um, to have some advantage there to have to be able to be able to lock the vehicle if they walk away or so on. But the only downfall is somebody could unlock the vehicle, uh, which does create a dangerous situation if they were just kind of playing a joke. So I think there are some things that need to be maybe some fixes that need to go in there where maybe they expire sessions or maybe they have some kind of maybe they have the car provide a unique token. Uh, that needs to be entered. So you have to be physically in the car to be able to, and the car needs to be on for you to be able to register your device or app. And that kind of got, expires over time. I don't know. But in this case, my guess is this use case wasn't under that scenario and they just need to update the software and the service to support that. Uh, but again, is it easy? Probably, maybe, maybe not, depending on how they're storing things in the back end. But in the same sense, they just have to consider it at first. Yeah. And you know what? If I was nefarious, I'm not, but if I was, this also gives car thieves kind of an interesting loophole. You know, go and rent cars from Enterprise, link up the Ford Sync or various other manufacturers, and don't unsync it because now you can find out where the car is, wherever it is in the city, unlock the car, and drive it off. Um not a good thing. I, I'm kind of hoping that safeguard is in there, especially for the key fob, that it won't stay started for too long without the key fob. Hey, you know, I think Kurt has a view from the DEF CON and Black Hat convention that can be shared with this. Take it away, Mr. Kurt. Well, you know, to me, the most interesting thing about this is that it shows that there there's a critical link that's still in place, and that is between the convenience bus now that's that's the bus that lets you do things like control and entertainment and whatever voice assistant is in the car and the can bus that's the the automotive control bus that uh, controls things like starting the vehicle braking uh steering in some cases for the vehicles that are still uh, that are fly by wire essentially and that's troubling to me you know we've seen at both black hat and defcon examples of individuals who figured out how to get into the vehicle through the entertainment side and gain complete control over the vehicle with the CAN, bu uh, CAN bus. Um, this would allow the same thing only remotely. I mean, here, once you have been in the vehicle, essentially a, a talented hacker could own that vehicle. Um, and Brian, you, you're, you're right. You talk about things like the, the key fob. Well, my local Ace Hardware will cut you a new electronic key fob. And in terms of taking the vehicle and having it operate only for a particular period of time, well, all you really need is enough time to help it drive up on the back of one of the big flatbed trucks, and it's gone. Once it's at the chop shop, no one really cares whether it will stop start again. This is one of those things where there really should be, especially for big fleet owners like the, the car rental companies, some way for them to go in either uh, through the diagnostic bus, um, the, the ODB2 uh, interface, or some other way to essentially reset all of the associated smartphones at the end of every rental. Now, the only thing that's going to be, be tricky here is that especially in very high traffic locations, I live only about 15 minutes from one here in Orlando at the Orlando International Airport, uh, Las Vegas Airport, 
Los Angeles. There are a bunch of others. They are, especially at peak times, churning through those return vehicles as fast as possible. So wiping it really does need to be essentially a plug, hit a button, play, drive it away sort of operation. But that doesn't strike me as the sort of thing that should be a, well, electronic bridge too far for the designers. Well, thank you. You know what? Kurt's got some great points, and he's actually got the next bite. And it's basically, is cybersecurity a moral imperative? Kurt, let's hear about that. That sounds really interesting. Thanks, Brian. I went a couple of weeks ago to the Gartner Symposium. Now, this is Gartner's largest gathering of CIOs, CISOs, basically people whose jobs have C somewhere in the title. And on Monday morning, they have a keynote address that, that traditionally lays out the vision that they're going to present during the rest of the week, what the, the major theme is, any sort of new key words that are coming in, what, what people should expect. Now, this time, they had about half a dozen different analysts standing up on the stage at different times, giving different parts of their vision. And the one that struck me was a presentation given by Mbula Shun, Senior Principal Analyst for Gartner. And she was talking about the role of business in a digital society. Now, the digital society, she defined as the sum of all our interactions between humans and technology. And according to her, part of the responsible business role is that the companies must invest in a safe digital society while they're protecting the enterprise. Now, just to put the finest possible point on it, she told the audience that, and I quote, security is a moral imperative in a digital society, end quote. Uh, the moral imperative, in her words, covers the responsibility of the company to society at large, to all of its stakeholders, as well as its shareholders. Now, I've been going to conferences like this for decades, and this is one of the first times I've ever heard someone stand up on a stage like this and talk about the moral imperative of doing something. Uh, we've talked about the importance of, for example, cybersecurity in the enterprise for providing herd immunity, for basically not being the point at which attackers can gain entry to a, a wider ecosystem. But this goes beyond that. This is saying that it's a business's responsibility. It's moral responsibility to use technology wisely and to protect the technology and data of its customers, partners, employees, and other stakeholders. Moral language is something you don't hear often around enterprise meetings. There is a particular philosophy of business that says that the, the absolute responsibility of the business is to the shareholders. And, and that's really the only responsibility that a company has. That in fulfilling that responsibility, a corporation has fulfilled every ethical and legal responsibility it has. This is saying something different. This is saying that the business has a moral responsibility to every single stakeholder. That involves, as we've said before, the, the customer, the employee, the partners, the suppliers, everybody who touches that company. Uh, I had an opportunity this immediate past week to go down to the uh, ISC Squared conference. Uh, it's called a congress because it brings together all their local chapters. But if you're not aware of it, ISC Squared is the organization that awards 
security certifications like the CISSP you see on so many business cards. I had a chance to speak to their chief operating officer, and I brought up this moral imperative idea to him. He said that he thinks that morality is very relevant today, and it is, in fact, about doing the right thing for society. He pointed out that for ISC Squared's members, the people for whom they have provided certification, it's not just about passing an exam, being endorsed by fellow professionals. There's a third component, and that is that they have to accept, abide by, and live up to a set of ethical canons provided by ISC Squared. Now, he said that ISC Squared has, on any number of occasions, revoked the professional certification of those found to have been in violation of those ethical standards. So, looping back to Gartner, in the, the end of her presentation, she said that collecting, finding data to collect is easy, but increasingly society and the customers in, at, in that society don't trust the corporations to do the right thing. So she said companies should institute three Ds regarding using and protecting user data. Decide to manage security and risk to protect all the stakeholders. Design to be a responsible custodian of customer data and drive to identify and build a societal value proposition. So, Lou, I'm, I'm going to turn to you. You manage a great deal of development within a corporation. When you're thinking about developing applications, when you're thinking about the way these applications will be used, does morality enter into your calculation? Or, to flip it around, is morality something that you're made aware of as the employee of a large corporation? Absolutely. I think it's one of those common sayings saying that says you do unto others as you want to do unto you. And it's like when you, when you, when you think about it, you, how do you want your data used? Do you want your data used at all? Um, you know, these types of things do come into play, especially when we're collecting data. We're thinking about collecting new data about something. We think, you know what, is this responsible for the health of the service? Um, do we really need any personal identifiable information for that? You know, really, is it just feature driven? That kind of thing. And so there's lots of things that we do that we consider. And it's not usually uh, related to technical reasons. It's usually definitely moral reasons. Uh, you know, because obviously it doesn't make sense for us to collect the data if we just are not going to use it, especially to keep up a service or an application uh, around things. So these are questions that we constantly ask ourselves. Uh, you know, a lot of organizations are doing this more and more now where instead of just kind of blindly collecting the information in hopes that they're going to use it later, they spend more time vetting it out and deciding on what's the most useful information and the least amount of information they can collect to do so. And I think a lot of organizations are starting to do this more and more, especially with because of GDPR and other things out there. Um, and so it becomes, you know, it sounds more technical than it is. It's, it's again, it's more of a moral thing of, you know what, if I didn't want my data like this being collected, uh, would I want to be, would a customer want that to be that way? Uh, and, and it happens a lot. And I think, I think it's good that we're starting to ask these questions because it helps us build these services in a way that people feel more comfortable and more private uh, with using. Well, frankly, I, I love the idea that we're using the word morality. I'm looking forward to more of these conversations. And as you said, I think the, the regulations like GDPR are formalizing what some of this morality means when it's put into action and are spurring more and more organizations to think about morality to try to get ahead of the regulations rather than simply react to them. Well, that's all the time we have for this particular, but I'm looking forward to future conversations on this because I do believe this is going to be a big issue as we move forward. But moving forward in today's episode of Twyatt, Lou, I'm going to hand it back to you. I think we have an ad and a great, great guest coming up. Thank you, Curtis. Yes, uh, up after the break, we're going to get into my favorite part of the show. We get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twilight Riot. But before we do, we have to think of another great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech. 
and that's Worldwide Technology. Now, if you ever had a chance to visit the Worldwide Technologies Advanced Technology Center, you should go because it is a truly amazing site to visit. They began building it almost 10 years ago, and it has grown exponentially. It really is like no other testing and research lab you've ever seen. Now, listen to what the lab contains. More than a half of billion dollars in equipment from hundreds of OEMs, ranging from heavyweights like Cisco, NetApp, and VMware to emerging disruptors like Tanium, Equinix, and Expanse. Now, when you are developing products, you, you want to you work with an organization that you can trust, right? Well, WWT is the trusted partner who will stay with you over the years. In fact, many of their customers have been with them for over a decade because they know WWT is where they can go to get the answers they need to make sure their business runs right. Now, with all that it has to offer, that ATC really is an incubator for IT innovation. Now, listen to what else it has to offer. It offers on-demand and schedulable labs like Cisco ACI segmentation migration and hundreds of other labs representing the newest advances in endpoint security architecture, software-defined networking, networking automation, primary and secondary storage. Now, you've worked on large projects and products before, right? Well, sometimes you want to try and build products before you know about the industry has to offer to help you. Well, the ATC can help you learn about products before you launch. Now, WWT's engineers use their environments to quickly spin up proof of concepts and pilots using their sandboxes so customers can confidently select the best solutions. And now, in many cases, this reduces the concept time for months to weeks, which actually incre- increases your speed to market. Now, they offer what they call lab as a service. It's a dedicated lab space within the ATC. And here, customers can perform programmatic testing using their vast technology ecosystem that WWT has already built. Now, it's virtual, so you can actually take advantage of it anywhere in the world at any time, 24 Seven. Now, WWT engineers work in these labs every day. They actually beta test new equipment and build reference architectures and custom integrations to actually help their customers make decisions and see results faster and with much less investment. Now, if you have time and you're e- you've actually been eagerly awaiting, the time is finally here. WWT has launched their new digital platform, which actually encompasses the ATC ecosystem. Now, this ecosystem creates a multiplier effect of knowledge, speed, and agility anytime, anywhere around the world for their customers. Now get access to their articles, case studies, hands-on labs, and other tools that make the difference in today's fast-paced world. To learn more about WWT and the ATC and sign up for access to their new on-demand lab platform, go to WWT.com slash twit and create an account today. That's WWT simplifies the complex. That's WWT.com slash twit. WWT delivering business and technology outcomes around the world. And we thank Worldwide Technologies for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Well, folks, it's now my favorite part of the time, time time of the show. We're actually bringing bringing a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twilight Wine. Today, we have Jonathan Lieberman, CEO and co-founder of Itopia. Welcome to the show, Jonathan. Hello, and uh, good afternoon. Great to be here. Thanks for being here. Now, before we get into to Brian's happy place with VDI, our, our audience loves to hear origin stories. Can you maybe take us through your journey through tech and how you ended up at Itopia? Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. So Itopia is now my third company. I uh, started two other companies and, uh, and uh, started Itopia really um, with the, uh, the idea um, that IT was moving to the cloud just as telecommunications um, had begun moving to the cloud in the late 90s uh, and, and early 2000s and um, sold a company um, in telecommunications uh, that helped companies um, deploy and, and manage um, hosted phone systems and uh, kind of had felt that I'd seen that movie before and and um, and for my next venture, um, wanted to help companies move IT stacks to the cloud. Really, starting with virtual desktop. And um, so we're bringing we're bringing the fun back into virtual desktop infrastructure, otherwise known as VDI, for those of us in the business. Fantastic. Now, can you maybe take a, I, I'm sure most of our audience knows what VDI is, but maybe take us through what that technology is, and maybe how that differs from this new thing we're calling desktop as a service. Sure, be happy to. So um, first of all, you know, we're based down here in South Florida. And um, as um, most of your audience probably knows, it's the home of Citrix. And um, most of the folks in our company um, have Citrix backgrounds and 
in one fashion or another. And um, Citrix really was the pioneer in the, the virtual desktop industry in that they created a remote uh, user capability for companies that wanted their workers to be able to access their Microsoft Windows infrastructure remotely. And uh, they created something called an ICA protocol uh, to provide a really good user experience to do that. And that was, at this point, uh, probably 25 years ago or so. And uh, Citrix, uh, to this day, um, really is the market leader um, in, in the space, uh, has roughly 50%, 60% market share. You have companies like VMware, um, you know, this probably has another 20% market share. Then, and then a handful of other companies that really make up the rest uh, of, the, of the industry. Um, so it's, it's an industry that's been around for a long time. Um, there's, two, uh, there's two market leaders. Um, but what's happening is that there's um, a big change, as we all know, of, of enterprises that want to move uh, to the cloud and specifically to hyperscale cloud computing. So companies like Citrix and VMware are really scrambling to figure out their strategies to help companies move from on-prem and into the cloud. And that's where we come in. Fantastic. Now, can you just maybe explain to the audience what VDI is? What are you, what are you actually doing with VDI? Uh, and then, like, how do, what does it kind of progress to the, to the desktop as a service? Sure. So VDI basically is, is taking your desktop computer um, and moving it to the cloud so that users, instead of, of um, using the processing power, our and the memory of their local device are accessing a virtual machine um, that's in a data center um, that enables them to essentially access their environment, you know, from anywhere, uh, from any device, and from any time. Uh, and what's happened uh, over the last few years is that there's uh, been a new breed of company born uh, called desktop as a service providers that essentially are delivering that VDI experience to companies as a service. Um, much like a, a managed service provider or a telecom or a you know, unified communication provider would deliver communication services, desktop as a service providers are delivering that VDI experience, that remote user experience as a service to their customers. And what we're doing is that we've created a software that enables the service providers uh, who are delivering it as a service uh, to do it in a very simple and elegant and very cost-effective way. Makes sense. So there's there's actually some interesting differences between the two technologies. Obviously, one seems to scale out more than the other. One's kind of on-prem versus and online versus solely online. Um, Victor, can you maybe bring up the kind of side by side chart that we had there, and maybe we can just go through this um, and kind of see the differences that we're seeing. Um, so for on-premise VDI, um, obviously more for on-premise and design versus design for clouds. Um, Talk a little about single tenant versus multi tenancy, which is interesting, um, and of course the fact that there's some fixed capacity versus more of kind of elastic capacity uh, on the other side of things, um, and then kind of time to market, which is also an important thing. So I think maybe this will help us get into the next part that I wanted to try to go through, which is some of the things that VDI and maybe da desktop as a service can maybe help an organization. So I want to kind of go through these questions that we've gotten to, to help you maybe define whether they will help when you go to desktop as a service versus be the same. So for instance, um, can VDI answer pretty much any business use case as long as you have uh, a foundation to build to build correctly, Wh whether your environment or your setup is correct, can it solve anything, or is it something that's a very specific use case? Uh, so I, I would say that um, it's it's pretty much any use case. Uh, there there may be some uh, very arcane use cases that it may not be appropriate for, but but when when you're talking about VDI and when you're talking about companies that um, have you know, hundreds and in many cases, thousands of desktops. Uh, VDI is, a, is an important technology uh, really to help um, the company manage, you know, manage the environment. So, in, you, so it's got a very high level of penetration, um, you know, within the enterprise. Um, for, mm -hmm. 
virtually any use case. Um, but um, what's happened is that um, as companies are and as technology is moving to the cloud, um, we found that VDI is 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 very limited in that you've got to build out environments in data centers, in on-prem or private data centers, um, and st and 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 build them and, and size them. Uh, you know, for peak season, for peak hours. And what we've been able to do with DAS uh, and with our technology is help companies size the environments um, to be consumed on demand so that when, uh, when there's a lot of users online during peak hours, during working hours, the environment scales up. But when, um, when they're not needed, um, either off peak hours, overnight, weekends, um, or otherwise, the environment scales down, essentially enabling companies to realize the true potential of cloud computing. That's cool. So they so they actually only pay for the resources that they're using, and so then by this kind of scale up and scale down, it actually saves. You're saying they saves them money over time. Yeah, big savings um, that they're able to realize because um, they can provision the entire environment and 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 anywhere in the world uh, desktops. Uh, that they want, uh, but um, they only pay uh, when the desktops are actually being used. So um, it's not uncommon, you know, for desktops to be put to sleep for, you know, the vast majority of the day and then just woken up uh, for when they need to be used. They're therefore saving um, lots of money and really creating a very efficient uh, usage experience. So that kind of segues into the some my other uh, call out here when it kind of debunk in VDI side of things is that obviously VDI can sometimes be extremely expensive if it's built right. Now, how does this kind of change? Because there's the whole kind of total cost of ownership can be very high. And if you cheap up a little bit, things go wrong. Uh, how is this different? Um, obviously, you talked a little about scaling and elasticity, but is there anything else that comes along with you know, setting up VDI and deploying VDI that maybe desktop as a service actually changes for them? Absolutely. So one of the, the key areas is that when we talk about VDI, we are talking about one virtual machine uh, for every user. Um, that's a, a, a pretty standard deployment. Uh, with desktop as a service, you're able to uh, deploy multiple users per VM, in some cases, as many as 20 and 30 users per virtual machine. And so one can easily understand how, uh, you know, how that's going to uh, create a lot of efficiencies, particularly as you're scaling these out, you know, into hundreds and thousands of VMs. Um, and then you're able to, to, you know, leverage these VMs with many users. Um, so um, that's one of the key differences that we see. So one one interesting thing here is uh, there's another one that really calls this out and people think, hey, my data is actually safer because it's a virtual environment versus that kind of legacy solution, that legacy kind of manual desktop scenario. Is that true with VDI and does it even does it get better? Or does it get the same with with desktop as a service? Well, I mean, for sure, whether it's VDI or desktop as a service, the security aspects are going to be are going to be greatly enhanced um, than if uh, everybody has a PC under their desk or um, you know in their in their briefcase. Um, one of the the key drivers of of, of virtual desktop technology is that um, there's a whole range of protections that IT departments can impose on users um, with the data and keeping it secure, you know, and locked down in the data center uh, and prohibiting users from downloading customer list proprietary data and and other uh, and other material and, and sources that you know could be compromising for a company so um, in terms of the differences between desktop as a service and, and VDI uh, I think they both attain a pretty high level of security so you, that kind of brings to my next question what what are some kind of the protections that you actually adopt that people that you actually off, offer to adopters that are kind of additional on the desktop as service? Is it, you know, additional firewalls, is it sandboxes? What kind of other features are there? Right. Well, so in our case, you know, we've partnered with Google Cloud and our customers are able to take advantage uh, of all of the security capabilities that Google Cloud brings to the table, you know, so from virtual firewalls, 
uh, to virtual, um, you know, uh, uh, VPNs and all kinds of other tools uh, that that uh, that that Google brings to the table. Um, Google has a, a fantastic uh, identity and access management. A solution, and we're able to leverage those and bring those to our customers as well. Fantastic. Well, folks, when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about desktop as a service and bring in my co-host to actually ask some questions and drop some knowledge on the Twilight Ride. But before we do, we have to thank another great sponsor of this week in enterprise tech, and that is Thanks to Canary. Now, we all know that hackers take the least, the path of least resistance. And I'll say that in your organization, it's only as secure as your weakest link. And guess what? Who's your weakest link? Well, your users, of course. Now, organization have to start thinking about that assume breach mindset. But this is because on an average, it takes about 191 days for a company to actually realize there has been a data breach. Now, you and I hear about new breaches each and every day, and they're actually trending upwards. Now, companies spend millions of dollars on IT security, but still don't know when they were compromised. Now, take Marriott Hotels. 500 million guests were affected by the breach over a four year period. It's a long time. Now that's where Things Canary steps in. They have these awesome honeypot appliances. You sprinkle a couple of these things on your network and when there's a breach, you'll actually be alerted immediately. Now back in the early 2000s, people talked about using honeypots, but they're really easy. They weren't really easy to deploy. They're expensive. Canary has made, made it simple with zero administration and managing overhead. Canaries can be set up in under four minutes and within minutes configured. Now, for Canary, they would actually look identical, identical to a router, a switch, a NAS server, a Linux box, a Windows server. Attackers can't tell the difference. Now, things, the company behind Canaries has been fighting back in security game for over two decades. They train companies, militaries, and governments on how to break into the networks, and they've used that experience to actually build Canary. Now, you might think, well, hackers are going to know that these things are honeypots. Not at all. Things canaries don't look vulnerable at all on your network. They look valuable. They can put fake files on them or even enroll them in Active Directory. These devices ex are an, add extreme value to your fight against security breaches. Not only are they great value and they're licensed annually, and if they break down during that year, actually, Thinks will re just replace them. Now, since the price the price is actually really great, you can start with a few of them, scale them up over time. Some of the largest organizations in the world use Canaries on their network, and I think it's time for you to get that value as well. Don't end up on this year's list of top 10 data breaches. Visit canary.tool slash twit, and for just $7,500 per year, you get five Canaries, your own hosted console, upgrades, support, and maintenance for a full year. And we have a special offer for our audience. Use code TWIT in the How Do You Hear About Us box to get 10% off the price for life. Now, we're sure you'll love Things Canary, but if you're not happy, you can always return your Canaries with their two-month money-back guarantee for a full refund. That's canary.tools slash twit and enter the code TWIT in the How Do You Hear About Us box. And we thank Things Canary for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Well, folks, we've been talking with Jonathan Lieberman, CEO and co-founder of Itopia about VDI and desktop as a service. I did want to bring in my co-host in crime here. Chibert, you wanted to talk a little bit about some of the players in this market. Yeah, most certainly. I've been building VDI solutions for quite a while. In fact, at the University of Hawaii, I built a Citrix-based system with GPUs, and it was one of the first AutoCAD um, network installations in the state of Hawaii. Kind of fun. But AWS and Azure both have VDI solutions, and I'm kind of curious. Why Google? What was the advantage? Um, you know, why did you go to Google instead of some of the other players in the VDI that are already in the VDI game? Well, uh, that's a great question. Thank you. So uh, there's a few reasons. Uh, when, you know, when we started, uh, we started really as a as a managed service provider, um, and um, and we were deploying Citrix and VMware at the core, a lot of uh, Microsoft expertise as well. And as uh, we got further down the road and realized that um, there had to be a better way, we started thinking about you know, really um, getting rid of our data center, which we owned at the time, and teaming up with and partnering with one of the hyperscale cloud computing companies. So we 
looked at all of them, evaluated them. At the time, AWS was the only one that uh, that had a product in our category, uh, which is the AWS Workspaces. Microsoft didn't yet ha- didn't uh, have a, a product yet, uh, and and neither did did Google. So we really um, began researching and evaluating both of those, uh, and and we still evaluate AWS. But it really came down to two major things, as you know. Um, and, 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 and since you built out VDI, you, you can probably attest to this. To have a really good user experience, you need a great network um, uh, that has low latency, low packet loss. And when it comes to internet connectivity and connectivity generally, there's really nobody like Google in the market. Google owns roughly 20 to 25% of the entire internet. Uh, they have the world's largest private network by far. And there's typically fewer hops in their network uh, to get uh, to the data center than any other network. And as we began testing, we started to realize that uh, the user experience uh, was vastly superior with Google than any other of the providers. And so that was a key driver because we have to have happy customers. In order to have happy customers, you have to have a really good user experience. That was the first major reason. The second one really came down to cost. Um, you know, all the clouds are, are, are not the same when it comes to cost. And one of the key differentiators that Google Cloud brings to the table is something called custom machine types. Unlike Azure and AWS, Google has a lot more flexibility in the machine types that they allow you to deploy. So if you want a machine that has high RAM in low CPU, uh, you can you can select and configure that kind of machine. With the other two providers, if you want to um, deploy a machine that has high CPU, you're going to also have to um, increase the amount of uh, of RAM, and so that creates a lot more expense. So we found that consistently, Google was 20 to 30 percent less costly. Uh, when it came to infrastructure than the other two providers. So it really came down to the quality of the experience, the user experience, and cost. Well, speaking of costs, one of the other things that I played with is zero clients, thin clients, zero clients, and so forth. And one of the players is Teradici. Now, yes. a lot of people like Teradici, but there's some pretty heavy licensing fees in there. If we're trying to go for costs, why Teradici? Why do you actually have a line on your website that starts talking about Teradici loads? Right. So we have a partnership with Teradici for use cases that involve um, high you know, intensity graphics uh, for graphic designers. And um, most people in that business, and it's mostly in the media and entertainment space, will tell you that, Ter- that the Teradici client uh, is a uh, is is the best client in the market. Um, that is for you know roughly five to ten percent of the workloads that we're seeing out there. The vast majority of the workloads um, that that we deploy and manage, uh, and that our that our customers manage, are using the remote uh, desktop client from Microsoft. Um, but you know, for anybody that um, that's in the graphic design business uh, and needs um, you know three D rendering and other you know high intensity graphics, Teradici is a very good choice. So we partnered with them, and they've been a great partner uh, for us over the last couple of years. So speaking of specialized apps and so forth, I built AutoCAD. It got really expensive real fast. How do you guys handle? non-standard apps, you know, like AutoCAD, Revit, um, things like that. Right. So um, for, uh, for, for applications like that, um, in some cases, um, they're going to require GPUs. Um, and the great thing about working with Google Cloud is that uh, you can select them on an as-needed basis on a per VM basis. Um, they're not cheap, uh, that's for sure. Um, but uh, typically, what we find is that uh, customers that want to utilize and leverage a virtual desktop uh, for Revit uh, and uh, you know and and for some of the Adobe software absolutely does require a, a GPU attachment, which you have the flexibility of deploying through our technology. 
Yes, I do want to bring Kurt in because you have some questions, Kurt, as well about the market. I do. You know, it's not that long ago when we were we're seeing a lot of people talk about doing VDI using tablets, uh, using even large screen smartphones uh, or other very thin clients uh, for the user endpoint. Is is that a use case that you see very often? And you know what what kind of of use cases are are people talking about when they do want a, a sort of hyper mobile experience for their users? Yeah, so my view on that is that um, it's not a very prevalent use case. Um, I think there was a lot of hype around that, um, as you mentioned, you know, four or five years ago. But I, th what I think we've seen in the broader market in general is um, tablets just, um, in, in my view and in my personal experience, are, are just not a great user experience, uh, you know, as a workhorse, um, you know, computing device. Um, they certainly have their place in the market. Um, but as a workhorse, you know, day-to-day, -day, you know, computing device, uh, the vast majority of the users in our in our business are using laptops, you know, MacBooks, Chromebooks, uh, PCs, you know, of, of various sorts. Um, it's great, you know, that our technology brings to the table the capability, you know, the flexibility to use it on a smartphone or a tablet, but it's really the exception and not the rule. And it's something um, that somebody might do in a pinch, if you will, um, but not on a day-to-day -day basis, at least in our experience. All right. Well, to to keep going on that day-to-day that -day experience, you know, one of the things that I have seen where I've been out and, and seen people doing virtual desktops is in healthcare offices, medical offices. And I get the sense there that it is as much for security as it is for either cost savings or convenience. Is the security of having a desktop that is established and then torn down immediately upon the user logging out something that you hear users talk about as a a big reason why they're pushing for VDI? Absolutely. No question about it. The healthcare space is one of our key vertical markets. And, and as you mentioned, one of the key drivers there is security. Uh, HIPAA compliance um, is essential. And uh, that data, you know, that belongs to every single patient is sacred uh, and, and, and needs to be maintained, you know, first of all, by um, by IT in a, you know, in a unified and consistent manner. And the only way to do that is through a virtualized uh, infrastructure environment. So uh, healthcare is, is a key vertical uh, and uh, desktop as a service uh, and VDI deliver, you know, the security that's required. There's really no other way that you can accomplish, um, you know, the, the, the standard and level of security uh, that's required without, without uh, the technology that we bring to the table. Jonathan, thanks so much for being here. We're running a little low on time, but I do want to give you a chance and an opportunity to tell the folks at home where they could, should go to learn more about Itopia and how can they get started and take advantage of it. Well, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, gentlemen, uh, for, for the time today. Um, this was a lot of fun. We, um, we can be found at www.itopia.com. And we have a lot of uh, different ways um, that you can engage with us. The, the one that we recommend the most is, is that, that yellow button that you see right there to request a demo. It's really the best place to start. Um, you know, the first uh, phase would be that uh, we would jump on a call to do or video call to do a, uh, a quick discovery of understand what your requirements are. Um, and then uh, assuming that there's a good fit, um, we'll run through a demo uh, of our control plane um, and the user experience, and um, we would be happy to uh, to talk with anybody that has a, a use case that they want to look at. Um, perhaps um, they have some licensing renewals um, that are coming up, some old or obsolete infrastructure that needs to be replaced. Anything um, that uh, you want some help on just evaluating whether there's some alternatives out there, we'd love to talk to you. 
Well, folks, you've done it again. You've had you sat through another hour of the best staying enterprise podcast in the universe, according to nine out of ten virtual zero clients. But I want to make sure I thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to my co-hosts in crime. Starting with the very own Mr. Curtis Franklin. Curtis, you're busy with some maker projects out there. Where can people find you, your articles, and all that you're up to? Well, Lou, as always, people can find my writing at Dark Reading, especially at the edge of Dark Reading. Uh, have pieces like the one we talked about today on the moral imperative of security. Uh -huh. Have a piece coming up next week looking at password managers for small businesses. Uh, also working on a couple of features, one on games to teach security, the other on specific issues around how health care organizations are responding to the scourge of ransomware. So keep looking over at the edge of dark reading to find that and follow me on Twitter at KG4GWA. You can bet that I'll be tweeting out the URLs as soon as those articles are published. Thank you, Kurt. We also think our, have to thank our geek in paradise, Mr. Cheever, Ch Mr. Brian Chi. Where can we folks find you all over your work and how can they get a hold of you to give you some show topics? Well, obviously, I'm on Twitter, and my Twitter handle is ADVNETLAB, Advanced Net Lab. Or drop me an email. I'm Chebert at twit.tv, but better yet, why don't you drop an email to twiet at twit.tv, and that'll hit all the hosts. Well, you know, we've had all kinds of fun um, and so forth. Next week, if all goes well, I'm going to have an interesting announcement. Um as I head towards retirement, I've been asked to serve on a few advisory boards. And just as a teaser, next week I might have an announcement that I'm going to be in Texas next September. Fantastic. Exciting, Cheever. little tease there. Well, folks, also to thank you as well. You're the person who drops in each and every. Every week to watch and listen to our show to get your enterprise goodness. We want to make it easy for you to watch and listen and catch up on your enterprise news for the week. So go to our show page right now, twit.tv slash twiet. There you'll find all of our amazing episodes or back episodes, plus all the show notes, the co-host information, the guest information. In fact, we even give you all the links to the stories we're doing during the show. But more importantly, next to those videos, you get those really helpful download of subscribe links as well. You want to support our show? Go ahead and get your audio version, your video version, or your H2 video version of your choice. Listen to on any one of your devices or on any one of your pod catcher apps uh, that you choose. In fact, it's best the best way to stay on top of your enterprise and IT news. Now, after you subscribe, share the show with your friends, your family, your coworkers. In fact, remember, we also do this show live each and every week as well at 1.30 p.m. Pacific on, on, on Fridays. You can check that out at live.twit.tv. There you can come see how the show is run, all the behind the scenes that we do. In fact, if you want to watch the show live, you can jump into the chat room live as well. We have some really great characters there at irc.twit.tv. Go ahead and jump in and join the chat and join the show. You can ask some questions. You can really drive the way in the direction of the show for sure. Also, don't forget, if you, you can't join live, you can always come back and join the community. We have a brand new, great set of discussions at twit.community, www.twit.community. Now, all of our hosts, including all of the Twiat Riot posts out there, we talk about the shows, all the episodes, all these different topics. Check that out because it really is a great community. Even though it just started just recently, it's really filled out and it's done some really great, has really great discussions going on. So definitely join that if you can't jump in live. I also want to thank everyone who makes the show possible, especially to Leo and Lisa. They continue to support us in doing this week in Enterprise Tech each and every week, and we couldn't do the show without them. I also want to thank our all the engineers at Twit. And of course, I also want to thank Mr. Brian Chi once again, Mr. Chibert, who is our tireless producer. He does all the bookings, the plannings for the show. We really couldn't do this show without him. But before we sign out, we have to thank our TD for today, Victor. Victor, what, you know, we have to continue tradition here. What was the uh, main topic of today's show, or the theme, I guess we could say? Uh, before I go go to that, I just want to say happy birthday to Lou. Thank First, you, sir. That's what the that's what the graphic at the beginning was. And <laughs> I'm, one, I'm trying to forget about it, but thanks a lot. No, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Happy birthday to you. Sir. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but um, I learned a new great saying that I think can apply to a lot of things on a lot of our shows. Um, and that was, it, uh, 
anything could be an electronic bridge too far. So, ah, and I think I'm going to use that for a lot of things now. Very wise. Thanks, Kurt. Very wise. But <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just so sorry. You're so close, but yet so far. That would be virtualized at scale, but you're, you're very close. You're very close. But, well, uh, all right. Maybe next time. Maybe <laughs> next time. Thanks, Victor. And until next time, I'm Louis Moresca, just reminding you if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep twiddling.